On today's program, cutting edge ethics expert, Susan Liotto. She serves as chair of council of the London School of Economics and Political Science and as vice chair of the Global Partnership for Education. She's been appointed to the United Kingdom Cabinet Office's Advisory Committee on Business Appointments and the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Dr. Liotto is founding managing director of Susan Liotto and Associates, a consultancy in ethics matters internationally. She's out now with a new book called The Little Book of Big Ethical Questions, in which she tackles some of today's most thought-provoking ethical dilemmas, ranging in topic from family and friends, are you ethically obligated to help your neighbors, to work, should CEOs speak out about important social and political issues of the day, to health, would you tell someone who's suffering from dementia, someone close to them had died, to, of course, technology? Do you have an obligation to someone visiting your house to inform them you have a digital assistant? Well, to discuss this and much more, I'm pleased she's joining me right now. Susan Liotto, welcome. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Cutting edge ethics. What is that? Does that mean ethics for our time? Does that mean the questions that are, are more subtle? What is ethics versus cutting edge? So it's a great question. Uh, I teach at Stanford a course called Ethics on the Edge. Uh, and the way uh, we look at the question is effectively things that are of our time or um, looking into a future time. And it could be anything from autonomous weapons to 3D printed guns to gene editing um, and beyond. But what we also look at is questions that I describe as still on the edge, but shouldn't be. Questions that we should have already been able to resolve in society and as human beings. Questions like racism and sexual misconduct and inciting violence. You know, I'm curious when it comes to designing a course, let's just stick on the course you teach uh, for the moment. When it comes to designing a course, what is it that you feel has to be included versus something that perhaps would be relevant today and not relevant tomorrow or a year ago and uh, not a year ago? Obviously, I'm sure the pandemic has affected how you select what it is that you want to talk about. But besides that, there are probably issues that are as old as time itself that need to be addressed. Absolutely. So when I'm designing a course, I'm really designing uh, a way of communicating analysis. How do we think about these questions? And how can I prepare students to be ethically agile and thoughtful? So no matter what comes their way, uh, they're prepared to tackle and think through the question. So I'm not so much teaching to a particular subject area, although I do, as you point out, choose a selection of examples. I'm really teaching to how do we train our brains, our hearts, our souls to be able to respond effectively. And, um, and to be able to do so as individuals, but also um, as contributors to organizations, as employees, as volunteers, as members of a family even. Um, the second sort of overall uh, mission that I have is what I describe as democratizing ethics. I really want students, especially at an elite institution like Stanford, to be mindful of how we think about ethics in a way that is inclusive that uh, can be used, methodology that can be used um, by people from all walks of life uh, and from all cultures. And then finally, I'm very, very focused on assuring that edge doesn't just mean technology, that we always keep human beings and humanity front and center. So it's really a more uh, macro way of thinking about these problems and aiming for what I would call ethical agility than becoming a deep expert in the ethics of a particular topic. Let's talk about uh, the pandemic for a moment uh, and uh, some of the interesting cases that come up. You, uh, for example, talk about uh, there was a situation in Santa Monica, a friend of yours, someone you know, uh, and there was a, an, an elderly neighbor. And of course, uh, we all want to watch out for elderly neighbors that we like. That's a normal human thing, uh, hope they're doing well, and maybe, you know, carry the grocery bag occasionally for them or something like that. Uh, tell us about this uh, situation that probably thousands or millions of Americans, people all around the world faced uh, during the pandemic. How can I help this person and not put myself at risk or not put them at risk or something like this? So, so take us right in. 
So let me generalize a little bit because almost everyone I know has lived, as you point out, uh, a variation of this story, which is that someone who lives near us is in a very difficult situation because of COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, a highly contagious disease, and they need help. And in particular, early in the pandemic, um, pre-vaccination, it was very tricky, but it remains so. Um, and in my particular story, uh, the person who needs help actually had ongoing needs. And the real challenge is to know sort of where you draw the line and are you ethically obligated to help at all? Once you start, are you ethically obligated to continue? Uh, and what I try to point out, and I should say this um, at the start, is I never tell people what to do, uh, in part because I'll never have all of the relevant facts. Uh, and most importantly, because I won't be the one walking in the shoes uh, of the person who is living out the story, the consequences of the decision. But in this particular case, what I, what I try to point out is that we all want to be able to help, but nobody can do everything. Uh, and what's really important is to ask ourselves, are we in a situation first where there is really important and irreparable harm if we don't help? And are we the only option? Um, and to try to get to a point where there are other options, helping somebody to organize help from another source, perhaps other family members or volunteers, um, you know, trying to be very clear about what we can and cannot do, our own boundaries, and making sure that we protect our own family, particularly from a disease like COVID-19. So there are a number of factors, um, but all of uh, which come down to, we don't owe anybody necessarily uh, our organs, our money, our health. Uh, we make choices, but we owe people to be very clear about what we can and cannot do. And there are often many opportunities to help that we wouldn't necessarily think of up front. Um, but this has you know, been a situation where it has brought out the best of so many people, the most helpful sides of so many people, and has really brought the community together, notwithstanding the isolation that so many have suffered. You have a, quite a global background. I think it's fair to say you have a, a PhD in social policy from the London School of Economics. Uh, but also a Juris Doctor from Columbia University Law School uh, and um, various uh, master's degrees uh, in uh, Chinese, uh, African studies, uh, two bachelors from Stanford. Okay, you speak a number of languages, as do I. We can talk about that later on. Um, how do you get into the ethics business? Or is it a business? That may not even be the right word. How do you get into the ethics world? the milieu of ethics with uh, such a background as this? Was this planned? I mean, if you'd have a PhD in social policy from the London School of Economics, what would you normally do with that other than uh, open a consulting uh, firm regarding ethics? Well, normally, I mean, social policy is, is a very big field and people do everything from go into government and work on government policy to going into corporations or even NGOs. But um, my particular focus on that was on accountability of for-profit and non-profit organizations. So it actually was quite linked up with ethics. But really where I started with all of this was back as a young lawyer, when I started to see that the law just wasn't cutting it, that there was a huge gap between what the law was able to do in terms of providing guidelines for society and for individuals and sort of where we were and where we needed guidelines. And this... Uh, got worse as I watched Silicon Valley burgeon and technology. And the faster the pace of the technology, the further behind the law was lagging. And all of a sudden we were finding ourselves in situations, which by the way, we're still in today, where we don't have guidance from the law and we need to think about, well, where are we going to get that guidance? Um, the Just other pause, for, that pause for, for, for one minute there and, and highlight exactly what you mean, because I think it's very important that a lot of people uh, wonder well about regulation of you know Facebook or something like that or, or uh, the online world which seems kind of like the wild west and we who pay attention know that uh, kind of certain countries in Europe uh, the European Union they have much stricter regulations uh, for example than we do here in the United States uh, give an example or something when you when you first saw to yourself that you were deeply concerned about the law as you say lagging behind the world of technology as Silicon Valley plowed forward and continues to plow forward? 
So in the very beginning, my first experience with really with technology was uh, I was a Stanford undergraduate and the library made available uh, the first Mac computers. And we could borrow them for an hour and there was a very long queue to sign them out. But really we were just using them for word processing. It was sort of all of a sudden we were typing our papers and, and that was pretty much it. Where I really started to feel it was um, uh, with social media. And even in the early days of social media, because we started seeing reports of uh, misinformation, even though it wasn't getting quite the attention that it is today, we started wondering um, just how far and how fast things were going to go. There were questions very early on about children and what was appropriate for children. Um, so I, I think social media just at the beginning was the best example, but it remains the best example. There's a huge gap between, as you point out, uh, the guidelines we get from the law and the real uh, social ills that can happen. Now, I have to say, I'm very pro-innovation, very pro-tech, uh, and very pro-business when it comes to ethics. Uh, so I in no way want to understate the positives of social media. Um, but we need, uh, we need more legal guidance, and we also need more ethical guidance. Do you think it's too late for legal or ethical guidance to catch up? or, or uh, and there's an extension of that. Is ethical guidance something that is even uh, taken into account? Oftentimes, we have uh, we have such a uh, a need for uh, money and for success. You know, is is ethics compatible uh, with the mission of Silicon Valley? Well, I think it's a great question. Ethics can be compatible, is the way I would answer it, but it's a choice. And we, in fact, see a lot of people who are not making that choice. It's a commitment that might, in fact, result in fewer eyeballs on screens. It's a commitment that might result in lower profits. But there's plenty of margin in Silicon Valley uh, in terms of profit and in terms of numbers of users to integrate ethics much more effectively. And then I would also point out that we have a lot to do even at, uh, at the extreme end, extreme danger. Uh, bullying, harassment, sexual misconduct, uh, inciting violence, even if we were just to deal with the clearly what I would call black and white uh, societal issues, there's still plenty of space for profit, plenty of space for constructive engagements. Your previous book was The Power of Ethics, and this book, uh, The Little Book of Big Ethical Questions. I wonder if you could please to articulate the differences in the two books, uh, how you went about writing The Power of Ethics, and then how you went about writing this one and, and the various categories. I spoke about some of them in the introduction here. Uh, and it is a very compact book, but very easy to just sort of skim around, uh, open a page here, read an excerpt here, skim over there, read another one. And I think uh, it's a very uh, easy to glean something useful from this book because so many of the scenarios are, are relatable. So talk about the two books. What, what didn't you accomplish in The Power of Ethics, I guess, that you felt you had to do in this one? So the two books had very different goals. Um, the Power of Ethics, which by the way, is also aimed at people from all walks of life. It is not an academic book by any means. Um, the Power of Ethics sets out a forward framework that I developed that, uh, as I said, when we were discussing our, my Stanford class, really can apply to any ethical dilemma we might face. Anything from friends and family to the workplace to uh, stories we see in the news or scandals we see in the news that we're trying to understand. So these four words, uh, which are principles, information, stakeholders, and consequences, and we can talk about those if you'd like, but it's really uh, setting out how in a chapter uh, we can grab an ethics framework that without referring to individual philosophers, without getting too uh, academic, really does integrate a lot of that learning and becomes a habit. The other thing that the power of ethics does is it helps readers identify, zero in really quickly on what really matters in ethical dilemmas. And over the years, I've set about looking at what, what do different ethical dilemmas have in common? What does the social media dilemma have in common with racism, have in common uh, with the Boeing tragedies in Indonesia and Ethiopia, um, et cetera? And uh, I have identified six forces that the book goes through. And after reading the book, 
everybody tells me that they can just see these six forces everywhere around them. So one example is the, what I would call really an epidemic of binary thinking, of looking at the world in terms of right and wrong, black and white, uh, in or out, for example, uh, Brexit in the UK with the Europe. Um, but instead, uh, I try to show how gray a lot of our ethical dilemmas are and how the question really should be uh, when and under what circumstances would we, would we do something? We might engage in gene editing safely and ethically to cure cancer in an adult where the treatment won't be passed down the germline. On the other hand, uh, many listeners may have heard about the, the rogue Chinese scientist, Ho Jen Kui, who edited the genes of embryos, which is not in accordance with any experts uh, view or most experts view of acceptable practice today because that gene editing uh, has unpredictable side effects and can be passed down the human germline. So trying to, to substitute binary thinking for looking for opportunities and looking for risks instead. So that's one example of a force, but the power of ethics is really designed to uh, embed a couple of very clear ethics habits, use the framework, see where you see these forces. Um, on the other hand, the little book of big ethical questions is really a conversation starter or even a conversation with oneself. As you point out, uh, it can be read in any order. You don't have to even read a full chapter. You can choose a question from consumers, uh, consumer issues, you can choose another question from politics, uh, and I lay out scenarios that I try to make relatable to people from all walks of life, and then I lay out a very short, what I call an exploration. So I try to point out uh, various points of view, how you might think about things, and um, stir up conversation, and again, not in a spirit of telling people what to do or what to think, but in a spirit of getting everyone to start to think about the ethics of all of these questions. Talk about the four words that you mentioned before, these, these, these four words that are sort of core. Uh, break it down a little bit for us, and, and maybe it'll help illuminate how some of us think about uh, approaching these, these everyday situations or the big situations that, that we all are faced sort of through life and on a regular basis. Sure, so I'll give you the, the four words and I'll give you an example of what's really important in each. Um, the first word is principles. Uh, some people call them values and organizations can have principles or we each as individuals can have principles. Uh, and in fact, one of the exercises my Stanford students do is to try to come up with say five to seven principles that they think defines how they want to engage with the world. So principles might be something like respect or truth or uh, open-mindedness or integrity. Uh, and the key thing about principles is that we need to apply them as a group to all of our dilemmas. Um, so we become sort of coherent uh, in, our, uh, in our thinking. Um, we don't get to cherry pick. We don't get to say, oh, well, in this dilemma, it's really inconvenient to be respectful. So I'm gonna toss that out and I'll just apply my other four, okay? Um, and an example where principles kind of go off the rails is, uh, the, is the Uber situation um, uh, prior to the new CEO, where the principles were things like toe stomping and making magic. Now, it's, there's a red flag right away because it's very hard to hold yourself accountable for making magic or for toe stomping. So we can immediately sort of see that those are gonna be difficult uh, in terms of really driving ethical decisions. But the key thing about principles is that they really are each of our choices. And I lay out in the book uh, a lot of them that come from a wide variety of sources. And it really helps the reader say, oh, I really think that one's important. You know, Courage is really important for me or um, loyalty is really important for me. So it's a pretty, easy way for readers to just look at one, literally one box with a bunch of examples and, and start to think about what's important for, for each of us. Um, the second uh, rung on the framework is information. We're all familiar that we need information to make decisions. Um, what I try to say is that today's world, this edgy world we've been talking about, the importance of the information rung of the framework is often not so much the information we have, it's the information we lack, it's the gap. And we need to really be focused on one question here, which is, what do you wish you knew, but you don't? So in the case of gene editing, for example, we might really wish that we could know 
whether it's going to work to cure a disease or whether there would be side effects, what would those be? Um, but we also have, you know, what do you wish you knew in personal situations? If we don't know whether to intervene when a friend has done something, or perhaps we think a friend's potential partner is a terrible idea for them. Often we think we know more than we actually know. Um, so it's about really focusing on the gap in information. Uh, stakeholders is the third. Um, stakeholders I just define very straightforwardly as anybody or anything that affects your decision or is affected by your decision. So uh, on the edge, what happens is many people we will never meet are affected by our decisions. Simple example, if you post misinformation on a social media platform, you have no idea where it's going to end up. You have no idea how many people will act on it or how. Um, so we need to be more mindful than ever of just how many people we're affecting by our decisions. And then the final one is consequences. Um, and the takeaway here is what are the short, medium, and long-term consequences of our decision? And really try to think forward about not just what we know will happen, but what could happen. Uh, and what we tend to do, including large organizations and corporate CEOs, uh, is particularly in a world of uh, rapidly changing uh, challenges like COVID, where the, the science is evolving rapidly, or like the tragic situation with Ukraine, we make a decision for a couple of weeks, and then we make another one, and then we make another one. And at the end of sort of six weeks, we look back and we say, see, we were a long-term thinker. But in fact, we were a serial short-term thinker, if that makes sense. So those are the four words. How did defining these words help you go about making decisions in your life or making ethical judgments? I, I, I find particularly interesting the the articulation of the uh, lack of information being so crucial. And I think there are probably situations that we've all been in where we'd say, well, I, I'd have a different opinion, but I don't really know enough. I wish I knew more than I could make a different judgment, but I have to, okay, go with what I have. I have to go on the uh, knowledge and the awareness that I have. And as you said, you'll never know everything. So it's a question we all face sometimes. How can I form an opinion on this if I don't know at all? On the other hand, I know something. Shouldn't that be enough to form an opinion? I, I, I think I know uh, Timmy and Susan down the street well enough to, to imagine that, that maybe uh, every now and then when he gets drunk, he hits her or something. But, but I don't really know. You know, something like that. I mean, where do we say, well, I think I know enough to, to judge here? I think we all deal with inadequate information, either because we simply don't have access to the information or because, as with the COVID example, the information is changing. Um, and so it's a great question. What I think is important is that we monitor. So if we know one day that, that something about COVID, but the next week science tells us something different, that we follow changes in how the information evolves or how we can get more and more information. But I think um, what I love about your question is the recognition that we might not know everything. And where we really get ourselves in trouble is not where we recognize that we don't know everything, but we make the best decision we possibly can with the information we have. That's something we all have to do. Where we really see trouble ethically is where people think they know everything. So that's why arrogance is one of the biggest drivers of the spread of unethical behavior because arrogant people, and in particular, arrogant leaders, uh, think they know everything. So why, why bother to continue to seek additional information if you know everything, right? And that's what really gets us into trouble. So I think your question is great, and the way you asked it is great, because we all are in a situation where we're doing the best we can with what we have. Let's switch gears just a little bit. It's sort of, well, it's all sort of, you know, we always talk music on here, in the auto and the uh, uh, it's my life, my entire background, and uh, and you also, uh, well, you're not a professional musician, but you have music in your background, uh, and you you love music. Uh, what is music to you? Uh, did it change during the pandemic at all, or do you, did you stop going to concerts? Probably for a while you did online, uh, listen to your favorite recordings, Schubert Unfinished, or of Aretha Franklin, whatever you listen to. Uh, what does music do for you? Does it help in a sense give you an ethical framework 
in a very abstract way, but you know, I think there's a truth in music that is rare to find anywhere in the world, except perhaps right there in, in the in the great pieces of music that have been sustaining humanity for hundreds of years. So I love the fact that we're talking about music and music does so many things for humanity, as you say, but also for ethics. Uh, in a very concrete way, we see principles operating in music all the time. So an example I would give is Bach. There are very, very clear principles of uh, tonality, of structure in um, particularly musicians like Bach that, um, that are so influential for so many of us. Uh, and in fact, that kind of music can be very reassuring when we listen to it. We have certain uh, tonal configurations. Um, we have certain structural um, uh, things that happen in pieces of music of that era that whether or not we understand what's happening from a, from a music theory point of view, we just sort of feel it. I think the other thing music does for us is it's a connector. Uh, it starts conversations. We can share the joy of listening to music. We can share the joy of introducing a friend or a family member to something new uh, or, or hearing something new for the first time. I didn't go to any concerts during COVID. I still haven't been to a concert and I miss it terribly. Um, uh, but yes, even what I saw, I saw some of those wonderful things on, uh, on television. For example, a graduation ceremony that I saw where students were each in their rooms and the university orchestra all played together with all of the students in their own rooms. And it was absolutely remarkable. So their music is an incredible connector. Um, and the other thing is that music happens in time. We are temporal beings. And so it's very connected in a way to this responsibility of ethics to think about the impact of the ethics of our decisions over time. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly engaging with music in that way is sort of what's going to happen next. But I, uh, I am very much an amateur. I'm not like you. I'm not a professional. I never achieved that level. Um, but I would say the, my dream as a child, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was an orchestra conductor. And I still sort of think that that's what ethics is about. It's everybody in an organization or everybody in a society sort of bringing their best and unique self to how we engage with each other um, and creating some, some wonderful harmonies and uh, sometimes some wonderful dissonance, um, but all with a lot of respect and all with a lot of creativity and all with a lot of positive spirit and, and intense humanity. So um, yes, I, I'm a, dev a devoted fan of music. Intense humanity is such a good way of putting it because a, a real music professional, I think, uh, deletes how they may feel personally when it comes time to the concert and puts the music ahead of everything else. And if it's been a rough day or if you've gotten to a fight with uh, someone at home or someone on stage, uh, when it comes to the music, a true great professional uh, places that on the pedestal and nothing else. So if it's time to play Mozart, uh, that takes precedence over anything else. And, and the spirit of humanity shines through the music uh, and it can completely erase uh, whatever bad time you may be having. I, I've even felt not physically great at the start of a concert. And when the music starts, somehow I'm even physically cured, not just uh, emotionally challenged and nurtured. And of course, we appreciate the distances uh, very much as well. It would be so boring life and all of our interactions if they were all perfectly smooth. And, and I think that's that's part of why people gravitate towards, I don't know, late Beethoven, for example. We hear these wild harmonies and these shocking mm -hmm. turns in the late Beethoven quartet, not to mention a Schoenberg or something where we, right. we know it's, it can sound deeply unpleasant, uh, but we go back and we hear it again. And, and the unpleasantness, it gets even more interesting the more you hear it. So there are a couple of things that I, I would also like to emphasize. Um, and, and if I may, one example. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was always very um, tuned into uh, who was the conductor of the San Francisco Symphony. And I know you interviewed Michael Tilson Thomas. And one of the things that I saw him do when I used to bring my children to the Christmas concerts was um, he would uh, turn around to the audience, which most conductors don't do. Most conductors, as you well know, don't speak to the audience. But he would turn around to the audience and he would say, you're going to hear this. And he would point to the bassoon and the bassoon would play three or four bars. And he would point 
uh, to the violins and they would play three or four bars. And by doing that, um, he transformed, this is not his words, this is mine, but uh, so he may disagree with this. But for me, what he did was for people from all walks of life who might not know the music, he transformed an experience of listening some, to something for the first time into an experience of recognizing it, just like we might recognize a, you know, a piece of pop music. Um, and so people start listening for those themes um, as a matter of recognition and not just sort of hearing them for the first time. And in my ethics work, I mentioned democratizing ethics. That's very much what I'm trying to do with this forward framework it, and with these six forces that I lay out, um, which is to say, where do you see binary thinking? Where do you see contagion of unethical behavior? You know, these, these themes that people can recognize just like they recognize really well-known themes of music no matter what comes their way. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you mentioned Schoenberg. Well, we get into uh, atonality or we get into kinds of music that unlike Bach don't have the same kind of rules, don't have the same kind of predictability. And that's very much the ethics world we're in. We think we have a grasp on something and all of a sudden Ukraine happens that is mind boggling by any humanitarian point of view, or all of a sudden COVID happens and, you know, we shouldn't be, but we're totally unprepared for it. So it also, there's a parallel in music there of like, how do we listen to, how do we play, how do we sight read music where we don't necessarily know what's coming next? Um, so I love your examples. And the sight reading of music, the trick is to have one eye on the measure you're playing and the other eye a measure it to a head. Uh, and I, I remember as a, as a kid, I, I was very gifted with the ear, but I was never a great sight reader, probably because I relied on my ear so much. And then there was just a time I remember uh, practicing sight reading because it's a skill you can practice. Just take a piece of music you've never seen and open it and try to play it. And, uh, and then suddenly it became quite a, a good sight reader. Always happened overnight, it felt like. Uh, and I, I love the, the challenge of, of sort of seeing something new and uh, making it the best it possibly can be the first time. And this is uh, kind of like in, in the, the bigger world, we, we don't get a second chance Often we we don't get a second chance at responding to COVID. Well, and we don't have the time, right? I mean, yeah. from an ethics standpoint, most people, myself included, don't have hours and hours to pour over every dilemma that they might face, or ever over every story they might see in the news that they find of interest. And I was quite the opposite um, as a child. I I didn't really have a good ear, so I really had to work on that. But I did a lot of sight reading, but it was largely because I didn't practice as much as I should have. So I even found myself sometimes sight reading in lessons for which I should have uh, been better prepared. <laughs> um, but as you say, it's sort of one eye on the present and one eye on the future. That is exactly what I'm saying about the consequences over time of our decisions, thinking about the, the present and the short, medium, and long term all at the time of the decision. Talk to us uh, for a minute, if you would, about the ethics incubator. Well, what is this, uh, what is this organization this, uh, that you've started? They, they have uh, various conversations you have, and there are certain core themes. I, I like them all because they, they sort of, in a way, do what I try to do here, which is make connections between different areas that we might not always associate. So you have ethics and the arts, ethics and entrepreneurship, ethics and truth, uh, and, and you speak to various people. What is the Ethics Incubator and why does it exist? So the Ethics Incubator, um, in a way, like the little book of big ethical questions, is designed to have conversations. And I was very keen to showcase that ethics is everywhere. It's in the arts. Uh, it's in entrepreneurship. Uh, it's uh, in all kinds of nonprofit organizations, businesses, families, politics. So there's quite a range of people. I've had the privilege of speaking with um, people like um, the writer Sir Salman Rushdie, or a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with the director general of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, and we talked about the recent Olympics and the Russian skater. Uh, I've had the privilege of speaking to heads of museums, um, heads of dance troops, um, very uh, politicians, uh, the head of the World Food Program, uh, so large global multilateral organizations and NGOs, but very much just to show that no matter what walk of life you are, no matter what business you're in, no matter what your passion, uh, ethics is, a, is the great connector, um, both for individuals and, and also for society more generally. 
And music is the great connector too. Yeah. Music is <laughs> definitely the great connector. What is your what is your ultimate goal with this? To to draw more parallels, to to link things more closely that might not always think about being linked by the public? So there's some of that. There's making connections that um, people might not think of, but there's also just sparking conversations and just uh, having us connect with each other through these conversations, not so much about a theoretical ethical question, but ab about things that are really concrete that we all face day to day about, for example, do we care about the age of our presidential candidates? Um, does it matter if we vote? Um, are we going to donate our organs? Are we going to use Spotify for free? All of these kinds of questions um, that we face day to day and um, they all have ethical components. And so every, all of the work that I do, whether it's the Stanford teaching, the or advising organizations, the ethics incubator, wonderful conversations like this, it's all about trying to get people to connect with each other. Is there going to be another book coming? What is the big project you're, you're doing next? What is keeping you up at night that you say, I really need to tackle that? What is that? Great question. Uh, there are a couple of things. One is that I'm very focused on uh, trying to get this kind of thinking out to younger, um, to younger people. So high school, thinking about how could I come up with a high school curriculum? I'm trying to think about how I could also get it out there in other formats, for example, uh, games, uh, and in ways that are really accessible to people with all kinds of um, different cultural perspectives. How can we start to have conversations about ethical matters across cultures? So um, again, along this theme of all kinds of different conversations for the moment and the exact form it's going to take, I, I'm not quite sure yet. Well, you'll tell us when you are sure. And, uh, and meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to use this book that I, I have uh, right here. Uh, it is a small book, as, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> as I hold it up, the little book of big ethical questions, I'm going to use it as a conversation starter, uh, not that I usually need a conversation starter, but, I, but I'll use it as a jumping off point, certainly because uh, it is indeed worth looking through and saying, what, what would I do? And it's very easy to answer that hypothetically. And then when we're faced with something, it can be harder. But indeed, uh, for this book and this wonderful conversation and uh, a woman after my own heart in the connecting different fields uh, realm of things, Susan Liotto, Indeed, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel.